We can start now. Uma ben ane mitro aram na hu ane Gujarat Vidyapit na Vice Chancellor Rajendra Bhai Gujarati ma bolche. E pachi baki no kare kam akho Angreji ma ashe. Gujarati Saiti Akadami Vati tamara sabnu swagat kariye. Ane saate saate ek vastu ni आनंद पूरों के नी जाहिरात करवानु मन करूं चु। सूरताली स्वरस पची गुजराती साहित्य अकादमी एक पगलू आगर जाइज। आजे ए पोताना द्वज नीचे दासपोरा सेंटर नू आगर करेज। तो आपने नू स्वागत करिए। आजना कार्यक्रम में मारा पची राजेंद्र भाई बेशब्दों के शे ए पची रूपाली बेन बाग उमा बेन नो परिचय आपसे अने पोतानी जे मानुनी करवानी शे कर शे पची उमा बेन पोतानु वक्त भी आपसे समालोचना सुदर्शन भाई आशार करुं क्या सुधी जोड़ाई गया हो ए कर शे अने चले पंचम भाई आवाज दर्शन कर शे तो हूँ राजेंद्र भाई ने विनंति करूं के बेशब्द कहे राजेंद्र भाई आदरणीय वडिलो ने मित्रो साहित्य अकादमी ने साथ है ना कार्यक्रमों ने शुरुआत आपने एक कार्यक्रम हमना करो डायोस पुरानो उस तो को ना विमोचन गुजरात विद्यापीठ में आपने करिया गुजरात विद्यापीठ अन्य अकादमी साथ है मली अन्य जुदा जुदा कार्यक्रमों ने शुरुआत करी रहे हुए हैं पहला ये भी एक कल्पना है कि आपने फॉर्मल एमओयू करी है ना पच्ची शुरू करी है पर कार्यक्रमों था ये वधारे अगत्यों ने जो एमओयू कदाच हमें बड़ी बहु यूनिवर्सिटीयों साथ है करें अच्छा पर कार्यक्रमों थता होता नहीं इट कार्यक्रमों ये अगत्यों नो मुद्दों छे इटले आप सौ आमे साथे जोड़ा या छो अने ये रीते गुजरात विद्या पीठ साथे जोड़ा या छो अनो आनंद छे भविष्य मा विपुल भाई कैसे पन खरा के आपने सुनसु कार्यक्रमों नो आयोजन करी रहा चाहिए आ शुरुआत छे मैं कहूँ एम पहला एक पुस्तक नो विमोचन आपने आ मूल में अत्यारे जे विश्व में शांति निवाद अने हिंसा निवाद अब बन्ने ने लई ने कहीं ने कहीं कापड़े करवो पड़े वो हुए देखा ही रहे हुए चे त्यारे वैचारी करिते आपना सोनी एक स्पष्टता वो थती जाए धीमे धीमे अने ऐना अमल में मुक्ता जी ये कारण के वैचारिक स्पष्टता वो कदाच होई चे पर आपनी हिम्मत इतनी नथी ह इतने ये शक्ति जो आपने मले अमल मा मुकवानी तो चौकस अच्छे ये शांति नो वातावरण आपने बना भी शक्य है जारे गांधी ने बात आवे छे जारे आ बहु महत्वनो मुद्दो आज विश्व आखामा थे रहो छे अने इंसाना कारणों इंसानी वात अब दूज आपने बता समझिए चाहिए दिमें दिमें वधारे समझता जयशु पर मूल त्यां सुधी मने लगे छे के ये दिशा में आगर वधु अग्रू छे गुजराती में आपने कहवत छे के अन्य एवा उड़कार इतने आपने जारे अन्य हिंसक लिए छिए अने अहिंसक लिए छिए एक खोराक निवाद जे आपनी छे क्या थी शुरुआत करवी पड़े अमें विद्या पीठ में जुदा जुदा आवा प्रयोगो करी रहा छिए चौकसज क्यारे क अने मारी बात पूरी करूं जो डॉक्टर रूपाली बाग नमस्ते टू ऑल ऑफ यू प्रेजेंट हियर थैंक यू विपुल भाई थैंक यू राजेंद्र भाई आजे आई मीन इट्स अ वेरी हैप्पी ओकेशन दैट वी हैव अ डिस्टिंग्विश स्पीकर लाइक प्रोफेसर उमा दुपेलिया मिस्त्री विद अस एंड वी रियली लुक फॉरवर्ड टू लिस्टनिंग 
for reasons uh, mentioned by uh, Rajendra Bai. Uh, I was just, uh, you know, leafing through her very, very impressive uh, bio data spanning 24 pages is right here with me. And uh, the amount of uh, stupendous work that she has done, it took Prabhava Kemni, Emnu Karya Che Shikshan, Sanshodhan, Ityas Kshetre, Ke Apre Am Vachine, Igdam Achambit Tejaye. To begin with, uh, Professor Uma Dupelia Mestri, if I'm pronouncing uh, the second part of the surname correctly, a, uh, she's an emerita professor, Department of History, University of the Western Cape. Uh, her biodata spanning 24 pages establishes her as a very, very uh, fine scholar of a very great stature. And uh, the uh, diversity of the work that she has done. Emna Jo Mahatwana Prakashanuni Vatkarye, to, you know, she's known for her work on India South Africa connected histories. And she's the author with. Uh, Melharba C uh, of the book, I Shirshak said, Not Slave, Not Free, Indentured Labor, uh, published in 1992, From Cane Fields to Freedom, a Chronicle of Indian South African Life, published in year 2000. But she editor said of the book uh, Sita, Memoirs of Sita Gandhi, which has been published in 2003, and her uh, very well known book, Gandhi's Prisoner. The Life of Gandhi's Son, Manilal, published simultaneously in Cape Town and in New Delhi in the year 2004 and 2005. She's also the editor of the book In the Shadow of the Mahatma, A Granddaughter Remembers, which has been published in 2005. Uh, uh, she has occupied very many important positions. That is also worth uh, you know, mentioning. That she has toured across the world to deliver lectures and talks at prestigious institutions and universities. The amount of voluminous work that she's done. Ajnu Emnu Je talk che. That is uh, entitled uh, Gandhi's Phoenix Settlement, a window into endanger, uh, in indentured labor, the diaspora and heritage keeping. It lay emne hu amantra napu emnu vyakya napwa mati. E pehla thodi a center vishini baat kari to we are calling it a diaspora center. Now there are many diaspora centers in universities around the world, but uh, with the vision that mainly Vipul Bhai has, this diaspora center uh, promises to be a, a very different one. It lay Emma Abhyasan is Sanshodan to Thashej, but any archival value uh, conceptualized Kareluche. Uh, the, uh, you know, as Vipul Bhai mentioned, 47 years of work that the Gujarat, uh, Gujarati Literary Academy of the UK has done and the amount of uh, material that it has, material and experience that it has accumulated. So, Emati Archive Ubi Karvanu Ayojan Che. Apart from that, there will be talks by uh, and discussions by enlightened speakers and panels uh, that uh, there will also be a focus on diaspora, not only as a subject for theoretical study, but also diaspora as a lived uh, experience and lived reality. Uh, uh, academy is uh, three pronged uh, activities currently uh, language, literature, and culture. Uh, this, uh, you know, happens to be the foundation stone of the diaspora center as well. And that activities uh, featuring around these three areas will also be undertaken. Also, very important is that this is the diaspora center in its virtual avatar. But uh, it uh, uh, will uh, take uh, a concrete shape uh, anywhere on the soil of Gujarat, uh, where uh, later on it is also, you know, uh, the vision is to have branches around the world because the focus is uh, on Indian diaspora in general, but also on uh, Gujarati diaspora in particular. And uh, since the Gujarati diaspora is uh, found all across the world, 
there will be centers hopefully in the years to come so uh, with this background i think i do not want to eat into uma ben's time uh, i'd like to invite her to uh, deliver her talk uma ben may i request you to take over thank you very much for that introduction i'm going to start out with a poem and the poem has uh, you know relevance for phoenix settlement because it was written by a resident of phoenix settlement and it has relevance for the gujarati literary academy's project so just bear with me knowing that i'm not really a gujarati a fluent gujarati speaker um so the poem goes like this tujhne shu kahi bolavu mara madhura mitra bal tujhne shu kahi bolavu mara madhura mitra bal tujhne shu kahi ramadu tu aave ame angan soyu tujhe pagle ame hayu harasyu tumhe ame jeevan ni aash tare mukhde chan suraj tari aankhal di ma tara tu ame jeevan no deep i just lost my place um tu aave ame angan soyu tu pagle ame hayu harasu tu ame ame jeevan ni aash tare mukhde chan suraj tari aankhal di ma tara tu ame jeevan no deep tujhe ne shu kahi ramadu tujhe hasye fulda zarata ame sona haye hasata tu ame baag tanu bulbu tujhe ne shu kahi bolavu now this poem um i managed to recite thanks to the help of my very young uncle who is present um but it was written by my grandmother sushila gandhi and i found this poem in a book called the busmi adabs um uh, annual magazine it was in a collection in my father's file which also has about 20 to 30 gujarati poems written by him and in this suddenly i found this poem by my grandmother written soon after the birth of a grandson and we had no idea that she had written this particular poem and so i'm very grateful that my parents taught me the gujarati script so that i could write my own name and also be able to read other people's names um and so that is how i managed to spot this um my grandmother was also a uh, a great letter writer a uh, writer of letters from phoenix settlement about the business of phoenix and i fortunately um I think a disconnect hai gaya lage cha uma ben let's wait for a few minutes
Um, sorry, I, I did say that I would disappear for a while if the internet drops, and I think that's what happened. So you lost me for a while. Uh, can you now hear me? Yes, okay, I'm very sorry about that. Um, so what I wanted to say is that, um, you know, there, there's a large collection of South African Gujarati material in, uh, you know, that's not been accessible before. And there's been a project, a language and migration change um, headed by my husband, Professor Rajen Mistry at the University of Cape Town. And they're two postdoctoral students who came from India and who managed to collect and draw up an inventory of the South African literature. It's not a complete thing. And they aim to analyze the, um, the themes of the poems and the, of the writings. So this is a very important project. And I think it would link up very well with the uh, Gujarati Literary um, Academy. Uh, Rajin, don't Um, again, I, I mean, this is really unprecedented for it to drop so many times. Um, I would, I, I think what I would like to say is that the term diaspora um, can be a very conservative reactionary term. And in my own writings, I have hardly ever, uh, you know, um, used this particular term um, because um, I've regarded it as something that, um, you know, that the meaning of the term is that there is longing for the motherland, there's a desire for return. And for South African Indians, this doesn't make sense because they are seventh to eight generation South Africans. And it has not been something that we look for, uh, look to. It's more commonly associated with the Jewish diaspora. But the meaning of diaspora has kind of changed, it need not carry that idea of return. And there can be affinity, for instance, amongst the indentured colonies, former colonies where indentured laborers were settled. And uh, it can be a, a good thing. And I agreed to speak on this platform because I thought this was a good project. Um, uh, I think we do know how the diaspora can be mobilized for very reactionary Hindutva, Hindutva politics. And uh, as long as the goals of an, uh, a diaspora center are clear, um, I think, you know, and are progressive, and I've seen the outset, the concept, I think the concept of this diaspora center has been very well thought out, and it is aimed to promote the writings, and these are unheard, you know, People have not heard about these writings, and if it promotes them, I mean, I would like to see my father's poems made accessible and, uh, you know, to even understand what he uh, wrote. But I want to move on to um, my... Um, uh, 
my presentation, which is on Phoenix Settlement, and um, to, uh, to talk about Phoenix Settlement very specifically. It's not possible in a short talk like this to give, um, you know, a, a really detailed presentation, but to give you some ideas about what is Phoenix Settlement. And so I wanted to first start out with the ideas behind Phoenix Settlement. Gandhi did not want to call this his an ashram. He said this is a very Hindu term, but the settlement was not about Hindus. It was about all religions. Uh, it is in South Africa, I don't think they at that particular time, there was anything quite like Phoenix Settlement in terms of its racial configuration, in terms of its uh, religious configuration, in terms of the languages spoken at Phoenix Settlement, in terms of the class arrangement. It is really quite a unique uh, institution in South Africa at that particular time. Uh, many, there are many interpretations of what why Gandhi started Phoenix Settlement, but I want to focus on this one idea from, um, which is from um, uh, the um, John Ruskin's idea. John Ruskin was concerned about the inequalities in South Africa, in, in, in the world, uh, class inequalities. And he said that as long as there are wealthy people, the corollary of that is to have people who are extremely poor. They go together. And so what is the responsibility of the wealthy? When you have workers, how can you treat workers so that they begin to have a stake in the system? And Gandhi was an employer of labor. He was also wealthy. He was a lawyer earning a lot of money. And he came up with this plan of setting up Phoenix Settlement where a printing press would be lodged and the employees of this printing press would work alongside the owners and would have a share in the whole project. They would have the ability to own a piece of land and everybody, no matter what their skills, would earn an equal wage. So it is a very important economic experiment that he aimed to achieve where you have non-exploitative relations. But together with that, he was inspired by Tolstoy, who believed in living in harmony with nature and the importance of physical labor. Uh, education was to be a very important I'm sorry, I, this has never ever happened to me before and it's happened three times in one lecture. I hope that's the last. Um, so um, in addition to this, there was Nature Cure, 
but Gandhi also believed that it was possible to um, empower women. And so Phoenix Settlement was also about empowering women so that um, they could actually take an equal place in the workplace. And um, the goal of this was to actually uh, make sure that women moved out of the, um, uh, you know, the uh, domestic sphere into the public sphere. But Phoenix Settlement also became a Satyagraha institution preparing resi uh, resistors. When Gandhi departed from South Africa, he also um, uh, left, moved away from this individual, him as the owner of Phoenix Settlement and empowered it to a board of trustees. Um, so um, here, this is one of the few photographs that we have of the printing press at Phoenix. This is the original printing press that was started by Gandhi. And here are the first residents of Phoenix Settlement. Uh, we don't have any pictures of other dwellings at Phoenix Settlement, but they were individual houses and it was more what James Hunt calls a village. I wanted to talk about indentured labor. When Phoenix Settlement was started, it was 40 years um, that indentured labor was already in existence. And uh, some historians who are very provocative have argued that uh, Indian opinion did not play much attention to uh, indentured labor, but they're totally wrong. And it comes from a not close reading of Indian opinion. Indian opinion from the very beginning documented the plight of thing to drop you know as many as so many times um, but I will move on and um, and to talk about the endangered laborers that Gandhi when he left he said that they should look to Phoenix settlement for any wrongs that were uh, that they were suffering. Um, when Gandhi, my, my work is concerned with what happens to Phoenix Settlement when, um, oh. uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, oh, yes, okay. we can hear you. Okay, so my um, uh, work is concerned with what happens to Phoenix Settlement after Gandhi leaves. 
And um, there are two things that I wanted to stress that there is tangible heritage and intangible heritage. And the tangible heritage has to do with the buildings um, that are there. And the intangible heritage is what happens to the ideas of Gandhi, to what extent those who ran Phoenix Settlement after him were able to um, completely um, live up to Gandhi's ideas. The, um, so Gandhi's sons, Manilal and Ramdas Gandhi arrived here to actually um, run Phoenix Settlement. And eventually Manilal Gandhi took over and together with his wife ran a Phoenix Settlement. The important point of uh, Manilal Gandhi's um, place at Phoenix Settlement is that he actually lived Gandhi's ideas. And in particular, the idea of Satyagraha, which was so important during the period of resistance and defiance in South Africa. Here we have him leading a march in 1946. In 1951, he also um, had an individual disobedience campaign. And here we see a policeman taking his name as he sits on a whites only bench. Uh, he also fasted in the 1950s, which drew international attention to Phoenix Settlement. And um, there were protests in um, uh, New York and all over in the international world, drew attention to Phoenix Settlement, fasting and apartheid. Uh, here we have one of the few pictures of the inside of the printing press building. Um, it was, uh, the printing was not up to the greatest technical standards. In fact, technical in innovations were not followed. Print, uh, the composition was by hand composing types. And this is a building I wanted to talk about in from the 1940s onwards, we begin to see more of heritage making in terms of buildings. And so Manilal Gandhi built this new printing press building in 1943. Um, and the old press building no longer exists. It was totally dismantled. Um, Indian opinion was a very strong force for advocating um, Satyagraha and as it says, to advance the moral, political, and social advancement of Indians. However, it also um, addressed many of the disabilities of Indians, uh, of Black South Africans, in its pages. Uh, an important moment occurred in the 1950s when Sarvadeya, which was the house of Gandhi, was rebuilt and reopened. This is the opening ceremony. And this is the rebuilding of Sarvadeya. Uh, it's Marilal and Sushila Gandhi gave the name Sarvadeya because it draws from John Ruskin's uh, book, Unto This Last, and it's Gandhi's translation of that book into Sarvadeya, which is the welfare of all. Um, and so, mm. Excuse this me, Uma Ben. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, your slides are not shared. Would you like me to share the slides for you? Please do so. I thought they were sharing. I think um, at the moment it's not. Can you do that? Uh, let me try. You just need to let me know which slide I should go. Where are you? Uh, at Indian opinion, um, uh, if you get the slide of server there, which I think is slide 14. Okay. Okay, um, so server there became uh, an institute, uh, uh, you know, a sort of, a, it was not quite a museum then, it was a prayer place. And so it was marked by simplicity. In fact, there was hardly any furniture there and hardly any uh, uh, you know, uh, artifacts in there. If you move to the next slide, you will see a photograph of my grandmother, Sushila Gandhi, inside Sarvodaya. 
And so in the 1950s, we begin to see Gandhi's house as a heritage site for people to come to pay tribute, but it's not a museum. It is actually a very spiritual site, a prayer site. Um, in the 1960s, a very important moment uh, occurs. Um, I don't know if you have the slide. The next slide is of um, Kasturba Gandhi School. Yes. Have you got that? Yep. Um, a, a Kasturba Gandhi school was built to provide education for um, the surrounding population in Inanda. And it had to be Indian because it was uh, government law at that time for schools to be segregated. So this was another tribute to Kasturba Gandhi. The next slide shows you a photograph of um, uh, Ila Gandhi, the only female there, uh, and Mewa Ram Gobin, who's on the extreme right, uh, protesting uh, about separate graduations at the University of Natal. Now, I mentioned this because, because of their university education, they brought something new to the management at Phoenix. They brought in a totally different, they were radicalized by student politics. Their friends were of all uh, not just Indian, but uh, amongst them was Steve Biko and the medical students at the uh, medical college. And uh, a very big moment was held in 1961. If you could move to the next slide, which is I think of the Mahatma Gandhi Clinic. Have you got that? Yeah. So the Mahatma Gandhi Clinic um, was started in 1961 at the time when Indian opinion was finally closed. If it, you look at my grandmother's letters, they are full of the trauma of managing Indian opinion in 1960, 1961. Mr. Nobath was the editor of Indian opinion, but the financial issues were really uh, immense and eventually it was closed down. And in place of that, a, a modern clinic was opened, which actually provided a service to the African poor in the Inanda region. The Gandhi centenary was a very important moment for, if you move to the next slide, in, in yeah. 1969. It was celebrated all over the world, but in South Africa, the South African government gave zero support to the celebration of the centenary. But the centenary was a very important moment in actually um, the management of um, Phoenix settlement. It, firstly, the trustees were broadened to include many people uh, beyond Indians. Uh, they were um, the, one of the African that, uh, leaders who was made a trustee was Albert Lutuli. And he became um, one of the trustees of Phoenix Settlement. So Phoenix Settlement becomes um, really a place in um, apartheid South Africa for all races to congregate. And the annual Gandhi lecture began to be held on the 2nd of October. And the ideas of Gandhi were very relevant at a time when apartheid was hardening. Um, at Phoenix fasting, uh, for the banned and detained occurred. And Gandhi's ideas were lived by those who were living at Phoenix. Uh, but there was also heritage making in that a museum was opened at Phoenix and the museum contained the relics of the printing press. Uh, Phoenix settlement also again was the place where Ila Gandhi and her husband Mewa Ramgobin and others revived the Natal Indian Congress. And so again, you have these dual things going on about maintaining the buildings at Phoenix, but also living Gandhi's ideas. An important moment occurred in the 1970s when my grandmother and Ila Gandhi moved out of Phoenix settlement. And so it no longer became a place of residence of the Gandhi family. But although that happened, uh, the ideas of Gandhi were spread off Phoenix. So this is what I want to say is that Phoenix is just not a place. It is a set of ideas and it is possible for those ideas to be lived 
of the settlement. And so the Satyagraha and the ideas of civil disobedience continued. And here we have uh, Sushila Gandhi urging people not to vote in the separate elections started up by, the, by Gandhi. But one of the consequences of the Gandhi family not living at Phoenix settlement is that it became slightly deserted. And in the 1980s, it, you begin to have the infiltration of um, informal settlers putting up shacks at Phoenix settlement. And in the violence that engulfed uh, the province, um, Phoenix settlement was actually burnt. It's important to say that Phoenix settlement was not destroyed because it was Gandhi's settlement. It was destroyed because it was caught up in the apartheid violence of the time. Now I only have one photograph here, but there are many photographs that show the destruction. So over there, which I showed, um, uh, can you see the destroyed international printing press building? Um, is this have you got the bond? slide of that? Um, of the International Printing Press building. Yeah. It's slide 21, I think. Is this the one? I think I've shared this one. Can okay. you see? Um, can you move to the next slide, which points to Phoenix Settlement as it is today? Is which is slide the... 22. Let me check. Slide 22 is this? Yeah. I think this. Um, so today, what is the state of Phoenix settlement? There was a long gap between 1985 and, two, um, uh, and 1995, 10 years of absolute desolation at Phoenix settlement. Here you see you know, the shacks um, on either side of the road. If you move to the next slide, which shows its security gate, Right. Have you got that? Uh, yeah, I think so. Is this the one? It's 20, slide 25. Uh, yeah, okay, carry on. And then you have security gates there. And then you have uh, a photograph of Bongani in Tembu, who is the uh, tourist guide at Phoenix Settlement. In the 1990s, Phoenix Settlement was rebuilt as a result of the efforts of the Indian government and the South African government. And um, the, uh, if you move to the slide, which shows you a center for learning and then the computer centers, computers in the uh, building. Yeah. Okay. so. We are moving quite far away from Gandhi's idea of Phoenix settlement. We have now embraced technology. And so the computers are an important part of um, uh, the, um, um, you know, uh, educating the surrounding people. So it is important that what happens in the current status is that out of Gandhi's 100 acres, 80 acres have been ceded to the informal settlement dwellers. And the buildings which comprise 20 acres are is what remains in the hands of the trust. But the idea of Phoenix is that it must serve the neighboring population. It is not just about preserving the buildings. And so the computer center is there to advance the education of the African population that lives there. And also the clinic continues to serve the interests of the uh, population. Um, if you move to the next slide, you will see Kasturba Bhuvan, which is Manila and Sushila Gandhi's home. It was rebuilt. And uh, in the background, you see uh, the house being rebuilt. Uh, if you move to the statue of uh, the image of the statue of Mahatma Gandhi, this was uh, donated by the government of India. It's one of the biggest tourist spots in at Phoenix Settlement. And it is um, very, um, you know, uh, this uh, tourist love standing in front of this particular statue. Uh, so there is a lot of heritage making. Um, Thirva there, which was in the 1985, was stripped to the foundations. There was nothing left of this building was rebuilt in its original form. And today it is a museum. If you enter 
there, you will find the books that have inspired Gandhi, the ideas that inspired Gandhi, and uh, the international movements that have been inspired by Gandhi's philosophy. This is the Gandhi Hall, the former uh, Gandhi Museum. And here we have a Shembe prayer. Uh, the neighboring um, Shembe is a very, uh, the Nazare Nazaretha uh, church is a very powerful church in this region and has a long association with Phoenix settlement. Here we have um, Albertina Lutuli, Swaminathan Govindan and Ila Gandhi at an opening of an interactive uh, museum exhibition. Um, so you see that we have moved more into the museum world, but it is still the ideas of Phoenix Settlement is service. And I wanted to end off with my talk with this photograph of the children of the neighboring uh, area, which is the Bambai area. In fact, Phoenix Settlement is now part of Bambai. And here we have Mzwake uh, um, Mbata. Uh, it's my very last uh, slide, Pancham. Um, he actually is teaching, uh, speaking to little children at the um, uh, reading club that he started. So what's very important is that Phoenix Settlement has embraced the Bambai community. And from the Bambai community, there's leadership emerging that's beginning to take over the activities of Phoenix Settlement. So much if the question is what happened after Gandhi left? So, you know, the printing press survived for a very long time. The idea of a village disappeared very quickly. The ideas of resistance and fasting survived for a very long time and agriculture continued right into, um, you know, in, for a very long time. Um, and, and the uh, uh, Manilal Gandhi managed to actually grow sugarcane, vegetables and so forth and carried on with that for a very long time. In fact, agriculture continued right until the 1970s. So what happens today is we encourage the uh, community, Bambai community there to have start uh, little food gardens. And so that occurs on a very small scale. But the uh, biggest idea, uh, you know, Gandhi envisaged this as a non-segregated space. And so for all its history, Phoenix Settlement was a non-racial space. It was engaged with the communities and it is motivated by the idea that as, they, as long as there is poverty, there can never be true democracy. And it, the trustees are guided by the idea of Sarvodaya, that is the welfare of all, that unless all have something, nobody will be at peace and in happiness. Um, so a Phoenix Settlement is now a um, national heritage site. And the goal is to have a UNESCO, well, it, have it declared as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And that is something that is promoted by an African-American organization called the National Advancement uh, Society of African Americans, and they have been promoting this idea of UNESCO, uh, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The South African government doesn't quite have the will to see this through, and so there's a petition that is going around um, to support the idea of Phoenix Settlement as a World Heritage Site. It, from my talk, you will gather that most of Gandhi's ideas were actually implemented at Phoenix Settlement and it's the first of his several ashrams. And so it deserves, it's a site of Satyagraha and it has inspired resistance across the world. And so for that reason, it deserves to be declared a world heritage site. I'm very relieved to say that I managed to complete this without any further technical technological problems. I've never had as many as I've had here. And thank you, Pancham Bhai, for showing the slides because I think the slides were actually causing the disruption. So thank you very much. And I hope I haven't taken too much of your time. Pleasure.
पंचमबार रूपाली बहन इन कंक्लूड तुम्हारे कहीं के हुए थे अनम्यूट करूं पर I was listening with deep interest and engagement, uh, and uh, uh, coming from uh, Uma ji, I mean, such an authentic report with all the slides. Itni badi maja padi badu jovani janwani. The way she explained the trajectory, the trajectory of the Phoenix settlement from its uh, inception to uh, the current status, and uh, you know all the phases that it went through. uh i i've noted on all the points but i need not repeat what has been said it was really very enlightening to know how an idea that uh, uh, germinated or took birth uh, in the phoenix settlement could have such a tremendous impact on the world we are truly truly gratified for this talk and for all the slides thank you uma ji panjamba आभार विपुल भाई गुजराती साहित्य अकादमी वती मेरे समापन विधि करने तो ये सौ पहला तो आई एम वेरी मच थैंकफुल टू उमाबेन फॉर एक्सेप्टिंग द इन्विटेशन ऑफ गुजराती लिटररी एकडेमी एंड प्रेजेंटिंग सच अ वंडरफुल टॉपिक इन इट्स डेफ्थ एंड ब्रेथ राजेन्द्र भाई खिमाणी जी अँ हाजर है गुजराती गुजरात विद्यापीठ साथ रही गुजराती साहित्य अकादमी आ कार्यक्रम कर तो एना एक आगे वन तरीके एमने शुरुआत में बे शब्दों कहा एम राजेन्द्र भाई हिमाणी तमो खूब खूब आभार रूपाली बेने अँ हाजर रही उमाबेन परिचय आप एक प्रस्तावना पूरी पाड़ी डायास्पोरा सेंटर की बात करी और सौ दर्शक श्रोता मित्रों ने जाकारी आपी तो एना थैंक यू रूपाली बेन फॉर गिविंग सच an interesting introduction to uma ben and also uh, the um, the background about the diaspora center ane hu amari karobari samiti ke jemne amne aa karyakram karvani tak puri paadi amate i'm very much thankful to our um, executive committee sudarshan bhai hazar rahi shakya nahi so in absence of sudarshan bhai again thank you rupali ben for giving Uh, some final commentary and putting uh, um, umaben's lecture in perspective and thank you very much to all the uh, members friends who joined in this event darshak mitro shrota mitro tamara vagar to karyakram kevi rite safal kari shakiye and please accept our um, apologies for the technical inconvenience par tem chhata apne gandhi chindya marge chalta rahiye chhe we follow gandhi we don't get deterred with it any issues and we move step by step in the right direction i think that is something we always take uh, thank you very much for being here over to you uh, vipul bhai panchum bhai allow some people from south africa to say something there is also sure. a former vice chancellor of the university that uh, sure i think now um, anyone can raise the hand and then we can have a little bit of uh, comment or discussion please feel free to raise your comment and put forward your viewpoint just to no. say that um betsy govenden just to say that uh, being familiar with the settlement but uh, listening to uma give the chronological development and also the deep meaning and ethos and the practices uh, at at the settlement was deeply moving for me personally but also encouraging that there is the space in the world and in this southern tip of the continent that can really be a place of healing a place of hope a place of true humanity and i really want to thank uma for that yeah yeah thank you i think the next hand up is uh, hamant bhai hamant uh you may unmute yourself
Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uma, I just want to say thank you very much for a great talk. And those were stunning photographs. I really like them. My only concern is that a talk such as this should be presented at a bigger forum and spread through, especially in present day South Africa. We need to spread this message, we need to spread the word, and we need to get more people coming on board. So thank you very much. Thank you. The next, and I can say it's Carl Reddy. Uh, hi, thank you so much for the opportunity. I, uh, Uma, thank you so much. This was really uh, impressive. I grew up in Durban and uh, when I was at medical school, I remember visiting Gandhi settlement. We used to do stints at the clinic there. So it brought back a lot of memories. It was really interesting. And I'm now based in the US, but I'm looking forward to visiting the center when I actually go back to South Africa to visit. And I just want to mention, you know, Dr. Hemant Nobat has an extensive network, and I think he could be entrusted with uh, diffusing the contents of such a presentation to a far wider audience and getting far more uh, scope, you know, in terms of dissemination. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, the next hand is Kalpna Herala. Hello. Um, hi, Uma. Hello, everyone. I think, hi, Uma. Thank you so much. I think it's a fantastic uh, talk. Very, very interesting. Very, very inspiring. Um, not only highlighting, you know, uh, the Phoenix settlement and all its histories and as well as its complexities as well, both within a historical and I think in the contempt and its significance, particularly in the contemporary period. But it is also, I think, so important that, um, and I agree with the previous speaker that, you know, this should be um, perhaps uh, given also at another platform because especially our youth uh, need to be educated about these kinds of narratives. And, and while there's a great deal, you know, while well, we've written about the Phoenix settlement and its overall significance, I think um, these kind of narratives need, need to be out there more in the public so that our youth and, um, you know, the, the wider public and the younger generation have a sense of our history, you know, the people within it, its significance and its overall importance and implications. Thank you. Thank you. The next hand is Ramesh Bharat. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, and thank you more for a very insightful presentation. Uh, you know, for us in South Africa, who have been one or the connected to uh, the Phoenix settlement and been there safe, uh, and I've been there with, uh, on several occasions. Thank you for really what is important is to say that you've actually shared the truth and uh, in, in, in some way also, and you've justified it with the, with the many articles and the many pictures that you've shown, and you've gone a long way to really putting to bed untruths that may have been told uh, over the years. So thank you very much and congratulations on your presentation. And as colleagues have previously said, uh, this needs to be shared with a broader and a wider audience. And then in conclusion, uh, looking through your pictures, uh, it brought back very wonderful memories of my childhood days in Devon. Because you know that on one, uh, historically on one side of the Gandhi settlement was an Indian community and the other side were our African brothers and sisters and their apartheid. And I used to spend my school holidays in the Indian section which was very well known for producing the best mangoes along the uh, coast of KwaZulu Natal. And uh, so I used to stay there on holidays and we actually cycled within the grounds of uh, the Gandhi School. So thank you very much also for bringing back sweet memories. Thank you. Thank you for your lovely people. I 
think that's it. I don't have any other raised hands. Uh, Uma, Uma Ben, yeah, if you want to respond back, say something. Yes, I mean, I just like to, I wish that the uh, technology had been a bit better on my side because I would have gone at a slower pace, but I then just wanted to get through as much as I could. And, um, you know, I'm hoping, um, I mean, I do think we need, there's a lot of disinformation about Gandhi and that we need to put the record straight. And I'm hoping that my book will actually be published and that it will become an archive of Phoenix Settlement and that it would open up the whole question of how Phoenix Settlement changed over the years. And I think we can say that, you know, Phoenix Settlement is just not a place, but it's the spirit of the place. And so the spirit of the place was survived after Gandhi left, you know, thanks to his son Manilal and Sushila Gandhi. And then it went through a very depressing state between 1985 and 1995. I can't tell you how destructive that was uh, to have all the buildings burnt and looted and destroyed. And my grandmother died knowing that happened. And so she did not live to see it revive and come back to what it was. And we have to thank Ila for Gandhi for actually bringing back the spirit of Phoenix Settlement. As somebody who's grown up at Phoenix, when you go to Phoenix Settlement and when you go to Sabarmati Ashram, you get exactly the same feeling. Yeah, and it's yeah. because of Gandhi's spirit. You will feel exactly the same way and that spirit kind of died in that 1980s and 1990s. To resurrect that spirit took a lot of work. And as, you, as I ended off with that slide, that spirit is living there. Phoenix is extremely active. The Gandhi lecture is going to take place tomorrow at Phoenix Settlement. And we insist that it do so at Phoenix, even though people may be reluctant to drive through many informal dwellings and so forth and be scared. But it's there's no need to be scared. And um, when you get there, you see that the liveliness of Phoenix settlement that was there in my grandmother's and grandfather's time is actually back again. And so, you know, it's an end on a very positive note. Thank you very much. Thank you. Back to you, Vipulta. What can we say? A huge thank you to Uma Ben and all of you. Mitro, I'm a prayer, no karakram, I am puro karyache, and I have a question in Vigato. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you. <clears throat>